Let's pray to the Father. Dear Father, it's already been a blessed morning. It's a blessing to come in and be with our family here, to greet one another, to share with one another. It's a blessing to be greeted by our brother Gibby. Blessing to be led in song, Brother Matt. Blessing to have our words interpreted in sign language as we all worship here together for a few minutes this morning. Father, we look forward to Brother Hall blessing us with his wisdom, with his evangelistic fervor, with his desire to change the world. Father, we huddle together this morning under the flags of the nations. It's meant to create a crisis in our hearts. It's meant to remind us of the loss that surround us. Father, we don't come just to study, we come to be equipped. We don't come just to learn, we come to be ready to engage. And Father, we pray that this will never merely be an academic place for us, but it will always be a staging station where we gird on our armor and go out to fight against the evil one and save the lost of this dying world. Amen. We watch the news, we see the things that happen in the world around us, and we weep. At the same time, we shout a prayer of hope knowing that we have the answer to what ails this world and knowing that we have the ability in our modern time with all the technology and other things that we have to go and share it with everyone around us. Father, please help us to be ready for the task. Father, we're grateful for the generations of alumni that have come through this place. So many people who have sat in these chairs, um, sat under these flags and determined to go out and change the world. Our speaker is one of those, as are many of the rest. And Father, we just pray that we never forget that we're constantly surrounded, that we're constantly commissioned, and that we hold in our hands a mandate to speak cleanly the words of Christ to all those around us and to give words of hope to the lost. Father, you're not going to send Jesus again physically to this world to teach for us. You're not going to send the prophets or the angels. You have left that in our hands, and Father, we are ready for the task. And Father, we commit ourselves to go from this place and to take the gospel to the whole world. Father, we pray for all of our teachers in our classes. We pray for all the students as we learn. And Father, we just pray that um, we learn your truth in the spirit in which it's given, with the intent in which it's given, the heart in which it's given, and that we adequately are able to express that truth to a world that needs truth more than they need anything else. Be with us and guide us and be with those who are sick and hurting. We think of Dan Goodyear, we think of others who are struggling. Father, we think of those who are traveling. Father, we think of those who are part of our number who are never in this room scattered across Latin America, Asia, Africa, Oceania, so many other parts of this world. May they know that we celebrate the fact this morning that we're truly one, one army working for one God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very often Those who we have uh, are part of our number who are never in this standing room. in this pulpit and sharing what's going on around the world and what's going on in their ministries, and uh, we look for those opportunities and we look for people who who are involved in in good mission efforts because we believe that this is a school of training program that has an impact on the world and and we want good mission work to impact all of us as we prepare to, uh, to go out to the world. George Hall is one of those missionaries. George graduated from Sunset uh, back in 1970 and uh, since then has, has done uh, mission work in various places, even here in the United States, but Back in the 1990s, he uh, helped to found and, 
and now is the executive director of Biblical Institutes of Central America. Uh, that is a program in Nicaragua, Guatemala, and, um, and Honduras to train church planters, evangelists, to go out and preach the gospel and, and plant churches and save the lost and build the kingdom of God. And George has done a good job of that. And uh, we've been following his work for many, many years. George is a personal friend of mine. We go back a long ways here at the school and, and in various mission works. So I'm thankful that George is here and, and he's going to be sharing some principles with us. He's brought some materials that you uh, may take. Uh, this is a, a gospel presentation, both in written form and also on uh, CD. And it's just a simple gospel presentation that you can use to, to teach others. So uh, feel free to come by and take one of the CDs. DVDs. It's a DVD. And, and you're featured on the DVD, right? Yes, sir. All right. All right, so a younger George Hall is on this DVD, so uh, stop by and pick one up and, and you will enjoy it. George, come and preach the word. I thank God that I can be here with you this day and share some good thoughts from the word of God. Today I want us to try to see the heart of God and then imitate the heart of God. We have to always keep close to the one that uh, is our teacher, our trainer, our all in all and our everything, and that's our God of heaven. We see in the book of Genesis, God is dealing with Adam and Eve. Remember in two, chapter 2, verse 17, it says, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Well, you know what happened? They ate of it and they died. But now I see the character of God in chapter 3, in verse 9, he says, Adam, where are you? Where are you, Adam? It wasn't like God you know, misplaced his pen. And where does that guy go? He knew where Adam was. He wanted Adam to know where Adam was. And Adam was away from God because sin separates us from God. Adam had died in a spiritual way. And right away we see the heart of God. He's reaching out for the lost. And we must have that heart of God if we're going to be like God our sa and Jesus our Savior. And we go on through that chapter and we'll see that he talks about the future. He's talking to several, but he talks to the devil and said, Look, there's going to be a seed battle. Your seed and the seed of woman. And the seed of woman is going to get the best of you. And we know that that the seed was from the virgin called Mary. And we know that Isaiah predicted this. We know that in uh, dealing with the man by the name of Abraham, God promised that him that through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. In Acts chapter 3, the last part of that, we'll see that blessing was the forgiveness of sin. So sin's the problem when we know that the teaching of the gospel and having the heart of God is the answer to the problem. So we continue on in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 to 23. The day finally comes. Can you imagine all the struggles that Mary had? Going around and people saying, well, she, she's a virgin and she's got that little baby, you know. That doesn't add up. And you go up and you say, oh, let me see the little baby. Oh, yeah, what he, what's his name? His name's Jesus, but we call him God with us. <laughs> Mary, you must have had a hard delivery. <laughs> Sometimes we say, oh, we call our little angels, but Mary, don't be saying that. That's almost blasphemy to say that. Oh, he came to save his people from their sins. Mary, babies don't have people. This baby had people. This baby, Jesus lived that life and he lived a life of compassion and he gave himself in every way he wasn't a pulpit man there's no equivalent to a pulpit man in the new testament he was an evangelist he brought the good news he was baptized you know he baptized more than a baptizer baptizes and you know if you baptize more than a baptizer baptizes that makes you a baptizer too now, he himself didn't do the, the dunking, but he baptized more than John baptized for the remission of sins. He's interested in taking care of the sin problem. Sin's the problem. Like with Adam, it was the sin. With us, it's the sin. With the people in the world, it's the sin problem. And you and I must be dedicated 
to teaching the gospel to those who are left, left in sin. I want to look more to the heart of Jesus. I see in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and following. We've seen the same picture is over and over and over again, where he's out there healing and he's preaching the gospel, and then he looks upon the people and his heart's touched. I'm asking you a question, is our heart touched when we see the lost? Do we ever cry over the lost? Does it make a difference as we go from place to place and we see people in the world, we know that they're lost, they're separated from God. Jesus saw it all the time. His heart was smooth with compassion. We want the heart of Jesus. We want to be able to feel for people and know what their struggle is, that they're separated from God. And as Jesus continued to look at them, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. They were scattered. They, they didn't know where they were going. They were confused. And he said, we need to do some praying. We need to do some crying. And we need to do some praying for those that are lost. We need some more teachers. We need people that can harvest the lost. And that's where you and I come in. It must be our mission day and night. Jesus day and night. Night and day and day and night. He didn't come being carried around in some kind of a golden throne. He came as a humble servant and he came to give himself in every way and every chance. Especially on the cross. John 3.16 God so loved us. Why? Gave his only begotten son. Why? You know the answer to that. So we'd be saved, right? So we could be redeemed. And so it is. We must give our lives so that people can be saved. We must have the heart of Jesus. I love Luke chapter 15 all the way through. Verse 1 and verse 2. We'll see first of all in verse 1 it talks about the uh, humble people. Uh, I keep thinking the, 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 the uh, sinners and the publicans. Uh, and uh, Jesus, they came to hear Jesus. They felt comfortable around Jesus. And then we see there's another group there the old scribes and the Pharisees. And you know what they're saying about Jesus? They're pointing to him. They said, this man, ha, 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 he receives sinners and he even eats with them. Can you believe it? And what do we do? Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Because Jesus eats with sinners and he receives sinners. And that's who we are. And that's our business. And we must have the heart of Jesus we must receive everybody, the lowly, the poor, the ones that are in the depths of sin and all kinds of sins. We have a Jesus that we want to be like. And this Jesus receives sinners and he wants to have some close fellowship. All through Luke, Luke chapter 15, they're talking about uh, saving people, saving people. And I like that prodigal son, don't you? Everyone likes that story. Guess what we see? Well, when that prodigal son comes home, what does the father do? He runs to him. And he puts his arms around him and kisses his neck. That's God. That's Jesus. That needs to be us that we have such rejoicing that something moves our heart in a special way and it's when people come home. I believe that literally, physically, we need to imitate God. God loves to party. And the thing that God parties over is when the lost are saved. Is there a greater day to celebrate in your life than the day when you were lost and became saved? The day of your salvation. Is there a greater time? You can do the birthdays. You can do the holidays. You can do all the days. But the number one day to celebrate is when we went from lost to being saved. When we went from dead to being alive. Why don't we literally have a party? Someone's... Someone say, why well, don't we get together and have his special food for what do you like? Lasagna, roast beef, what's your favorite? We're going to have that for you because we're here to celebrate you and your salvation. We want to stand up and say, brother new convert, I'm going to help you. I'm, I'm, I'm into prayer. I can't get around too much anymore, but I can pray. And here's my phone number. You better call me when you need prayer because I want to pray for you. Another one says, 
I like to help you learn some of the basic things. I like to get together your house or my house and study some things with you, help you mature. Someone else's this, that, another. Commit themselves to our new brother. Do you think he's strong? Do you think he knows the love of the church, of the family? He needs that. He needs a party. And it's party time when people are one to Jesus. It's time for hugs. It's time for rejoicing. All the lost. In, in Luke chapter 15. We'll see that the Great Commission was given by Jesus. We read a little bit about many, many, many times when he's dealing with lost and saving people and his heart's touched. But finally he gets down and he says all authority belongs to him. What does that mean? We better listen up. And he says, take the gospel into all the world. And maybe if you and I were apostles, we could say, Jesus, there's only 11 of us. How about just Jerusalem? All the world. How about just Judea, Jesus? Please, there's only 11 of us. All the world. But here's the clincher. Jesus says, I'll be with you. And God says, I'll provide everything according to his riches. Everything that you need. In Central America, we have these, uh, young, most of them are young people. And some have about like sixth grade, eighth grade education, high school education. As long as they read and write and love God, and want to learn how to teach the lost, we receive them. Some other stipulations. But you know, they're tremendous in reaching the gospel, taking the gospel, reaching the lost. They baptize thousands and thousands and thousands of people every year to the glory of God. To the glory of God. It's bad to steal. We don't want to steal the glory of God. But they don't have anything. You can offer them two or three hundred dollars and buy everything they have. But they have one thing. They believe that God wants us to take the gospel into all the world and that God will give them everything they need and God is doing that. We don't need church buildings. We don't need U.S. money. We, that's a, we don't want to put U.S. money on our graduates. We produce self-supported lifetime missionaries in their own culture. And they're doing a tremendous job because God is with them. And they are with God. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm overwhelmed by them. I can't, tell them no, I can't let them know that. But uh, I'm in awe of what they do in their relationship with God. Jesus is correct. He says, take the gospel into all the world. But how in the world can we do that? We can't do it through pulpit ministries. We've got to get out in the streets. We've got to be out there and teach day to day. But the way we see that we can do it, and it's working very well for us in Central America, we call it 2 2 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. You probably know it very well. Where Paul told Timothy the secret, the things that he had committed to him, the same commit down to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also and teach others also and others also. You get that pyramid going, that thing gets out of hand after a while. And that's what we want. We don't know how many baptisms we've had. We don't want to know if we know we're not multiplying. The book of Acts starts about adding and adding, but very quickly it starts about talking about multiplying and multiplying and multiplying. In order to take the gospel in all the world, we cannot just add. We must multiply. And we have to multiply by multiplying the teachers. I ask my students, can you teach three people a year very, very well how to teach others? And they smile, of course. They're already doing that while they're in school. On the weekends, that's what they do. They go out and the church is providing them people to teach, to teach others. So it's a piece of cake. They know how to do it when they hit the ground as graduates. They know how to start house churches when they graduate. And they go home and they do that in the next town down the road with their new disciples. So we get the thing going all over the place. Spreads like wildfire to the glory of God and because of God. And so that, that first year after the, you, you, tra you um, teach three, there's four of you, the teacher and the three students. The next year, all of you do the same thing. We teach our disciples to do the same thing. After that year, you have how many? 16. After three years, you have 64. After six years, you have 4,096. 
We know that the pyramids are not perfect. We know people quit, become unfaithful, move away, whatever. But if you have just a portion of a pyramid, you're going to reach thousands and thousands and thousands of people to the glory of God. I appreciate you listening to me today. And I ask that God be your, your model and that you have the heart of God. God bless you. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, I noticed that you're only partially dressed this morning. <laughs> but uh, we need to get you fully dressed as a, an alumnus of this school uh -huh. with the official, the official, official lapel button. pin that signifies that you are an honored graduate of Sunset International Bible Institute <coughs> slash Sunset School of Preaching. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. We love you and appreciate your, your enthusiasm for the gospel, brother. God bless you, too. Let's do something a little out of the ordinary uh, before we have announcements here and our, our prayer requests. Would you bow with me? Father, thank you so much for what we've heard this morning through our brother George Hall. Just have one simple request, Father, that you'll help us to hear his words and have the passion that he has to impact this world with the gospel message, the saving grace of Jesus. I pray that you'll light that fire in our hearts, that we'll look around at these flags, we'll determine according to your will where it is you want us to serve, and that we'll do it with all of our heart. Through Jesus, amen.